first why we're doing this actually. So in our field, in neuroimaging, we have a, a huge bunch of scientific software. It's usually written by scientists, which means they're not software developer, developers and it's it's difficult to run the software and why is this the case so the first problem we often have is that most tools require linux so now you say well this can't be a problem linux is a great operating system the problem is for clinical researchers it is a problem they often can't install linux on their boxes they have uh, they're very restricted by their system administrators what they can administer and um, often this is already a bottleneck so then the problem is even if you get something like linux running on your box the packages that we need are not in not in the standard package system. So if you just run apt install or yum install, you don't get these packages. They just don't exist. And then very wise people say, oh, it's trivial. Just compile it from source, right? Just there's nothing, nothing about it. The problem is a lot of our software is a pain to compile. So uh, just one of my examples here is a, is a toolkit that I've worked regularly with. with um, it takes about eight hours to compile. And that's, that's after you fixed all the problems in the make files. Um, because a lot of the things are not existing anymore and you need exactly the right versions of the compilers and it's just, a, it's not easy. Um, but yeah, then also when you, when you got it working, um, the problem is that scientists, as I said, they're not software developers. So often they're not updating their libraries. So what can happen is you, a scientific software needs a very specific library. Uh, and when the operating system updates, this library disappears. So in this example, libpng12 is a very good example. They just got uh, removed from the uh, current packages and you can't just run our software anymore. So, uh, and then also the problem is because of all of this, it takes a long time. Let's say you get a new computer and you need to reinstall all tools and it takes a long time. And it's just in the end, it's not reproducible and we get different results between different software versions, which is really annoying for researchers. So. This is the problem. And now basically we said, well, how can we help with this mess? Uh, and here I just choose Python as an example from XKCD, but it's pretty much the same problem with, with all our software. But we don't want to create another package manager, right? We, we don't say there are 14 different package managers and all that don't work. Let's build a real package manager that works. And then we have a 15th one that also is not good. Um, so we try to avoid that. And um, what we said is let's, let's see what we can do with the existing technology that's out there. So this is basically existing repositories and software distribution methods like Conda, NeuroDebian. Um, combine that with containers like Docker and Singularity and with the platforms that we have like CVL, uh, the Nectar platform, and how can we run on these platforms our analysis. So uh, our design principles were that what we want to build has to run on Linux, Mac, and Windows. So that's why we said, okay, we want to use Docker for that because that gives us an easy way of running all of these platforms. We also need to run on high-performance computing clusters. So Docker is not the right way of doing this. That's why we need Singularity containers um, right now. I mean, I'm not saying there are the better technologies out there, but this is what currently works. So as I said, we need technology that is available now and that, that actually runs on the platforms that we have access to. Also, we wanted everything fully interactive. So we want a full Linux desktop interface so people can do what they want. We don't want a website where people click through and upload things and restricts them in their workflow. Um, also, it has to be lightweight. We don't want ours to in compile software, download software. It just has to run out of the box. And as I said, reuse existing tech as much as possible, not reinventing the wheel um, because we don't have time for that. So that's what we basically did. We built an automated container building um, architecture on GitHub that runs with GitHub Actions. People submit recipes uh, to this uh, repository. They get automatically built and tested. And then we push them out to the Docker library and we build a singularity container that we host on simple object storage. Um, then we build a little lightweight Linux desktop in a Docker container around it. So people don't have to worry about all that complexity of installing Singularity, downloading Singularity containers. So we wrapped all of that nicely in a graphical user interface. And this is how it currently looks like. Uh, a user would just start our container. Then this currently starts the whole desktop environment. Uh, then the user can just open a browser um, and just goes to localhost port 6080 in this case, we're running a local NoVNC client inside the container. And then inside that container, we have all our software installed that people need. They can just uh, run it. Um, the container gets downloaded, unpacked, uh, and people yeah, can just start using it and, and, and look at it. So they don't have to worry about singularity, exec, singularity run. They don't have to do this. It's all uh, wrapped and nicely hidden for them. Um, so then 
one of our biggest problems and why we got involved with Arcos is uh, we need a place to store our, our container images. So currently we store it, as I said, on the Docker hub, and we had a lot of issues with pulling containers from the Docker hub because it is uh, not in Australia, so we get low download speeds. Uh, we're limited in, in the container size there. Um, and uh, we also need an, a singularity storage because we, we use a lot of singularity containers. Um, so we basically need something that offers this long-term storage of containers uh, because we want everything to be reproducible, um, ideally also worldwide, um, not just in Australia. We need a fast access, a local storage of this. So ideally, we even don't want to download the full containers to the client. So I will show a little bit what we did in this space. Uh, we also want deduplication of container content because a lot of our containers have overlap. And by just updating a container, we usually just change a couple of binaries in there, but it's still a 15 gigabyte image. So uh, we can't keep uh, storing that. Um, and also a lot of the software that we use is quite outdated. So what we would like to do is either work on automated vulnerability scanning so we understand uh, what problematic software is in old containers. And also uh, one idea that, that I would like to pursue is how can we limit containers what they can do on data? So basically only give them access to really what this container needs. So figure out that we can give the minimum, um, yeah, the minimum priorities for that container so that we're not uh, doing uh, stealing data, for example, right? That's a simple uh, case. So this is then a little proof of concept that I worked on in the last weeks uh, with the with the Arcos uh, group, where we said, okay, let's think about how could we build a container registry that would do everything that we need as a project. So I said, this is very much my use case for, for our project. Um, and what we did is we looked at what CERN does. So how does CERN distribute software? And they use something they call CVMFS. So it's a CERN virtual machine file system, which is basically a read-only file system in user space hosted on web servers. So it just needs a standard, uh, um, a standard web server and it uses content addressable storage and Merkle trees. So basically Git, uh, every file gets committed to a Git uh, repo. This means deduplication actually works. Um, and the data is transferred on demand to the client. So this means we don't have to download the whole container, but we can actually um, open the container directly on the CVMFS storage. And whenever something is needed within that container, it gets pulled via the web. And then as you see, there's a hierarchy of uh, multiple servers and a squid uh, proxy, so we can actually handle that load. So this system is supposed to scale very well and, uh, and CERN runs it on quite a large scale. Um, and that's how we currently build it. So we basically, uh, again, it was already showed in the beginning, we use GitHub to build all these things. Uh, we test these things, we put them to the uh, Docker hub and our GitHub registry, and then we build this cascade of servers. So with Stratum Zero, that's what I call the main server. The main server then has uh, clients, clients client server stratum one that mirror that server in different regions. So here we currently run that on uh, Oracle Cloud that supports us in this project, uh, where we run it in the US, in Europe, and in Australia. And uh, we pull these containers down uh, to the stratum zero, and then it goes through the hierarchy uh, to the stratum one servers. And then we have our end users on the end that use laptops, desktops, or high performance computing systems. Um, and there we use, uh, basically, if it's an HPC, we recommend that people set up a local squid proxy because otherwise every HPC node will uh, talk to our Stratum 1 server, which is problematic. So uh, a local squid is a good idea. Uh, the laptops uh, and the desktops, we allow them directly to talk to the Stratum 1s at, at the moment. So we, we haven't seen any, any scalability issues there. And we use a GeoIP service in the middle to identify what's the next server uh, close to that. And the thing is, we can also scale up how many Stratum 1 servers we have easily. So can be 10 and 10 and more servers without any problem. Um, so yeah, what's what's needed? What are the pain points? I think that was one of the questions. So currently we have for this project uh, at UQ, we have a zero point uh, FTE level A postdoc position available and the recruiting can start anytime. So if anyone is keen on working on this project and helping us and um, or has co-funding to fund this to a whole position, get in touch with us, that would be amazing. Um, also, it's an open source project. So if you think this is useful for you, uh, definitely have a look at it. Help us with the software and container testing that we're doing. Uh, we're working on simplifying the installation. Uh, we still have issues in, for example, making the desktop size adjustable to the Windows size. So if there's a, a system administrator out there that has done a lot of this in this space and knows how to uh, hack Linux in a way that it behaves 
how we want it. That would be really cool. And we're also working on interesting things where we want to run a singularity container inside a singularity container inside a Docker container. So basically multiple hierarchies of, of uh, containerization uh, because basically when we run on an HPC, as I said, we don't have Docker, but we basically want to run singularity and then we need uh, a couple of tricks there. And I think it, it, it would be possible and would enable a lot of things. So if anyone has, has played with these things, containers and containers and containers, that would be really cool. Um, that's pretty much it. So as I said, it's an open source project um, and there are lots of people involved. So I'm just uh, one of the developers there and I just presented it on behalf of a lot of people. So questions. Any questions for Stefan? Obviously, uh, you know, he's a total amateur at all of this and uh, he's just learning, so. Yes, as I said, I'm, I'm not a software developer, I'm just a researcher, so I have actually no idea about this. I'm just using oh, this stuff. It's been yes. facetious, Stefan. <laughs> uh, um, Stefan, a question noticed. about the use of CVMFS. So uh, are you setting up your own CVMFS service and everything to do yes. that? Are you piggybacking off CERNs or? How's no, it? exactly. I was thinking about picking back off CERN. So CERN runs it and you can actually submit containers to their uh, registry with a wish list. Uh, and they say it only takes 20 minutes to integrate our containers in their library. But uh, I just wanted to see how it works. So I set it up my on my own. And uh, okay. I also wanted some security scanning and a little bit more cybersecurity aspects of this whole system. So that's why I wanted to play with my own system for now. Right. Because one of the things we've been thinking about is there are a few groups now in Australia who are using CVMFS and, and a few others who have expressed interest in it. So providing a sort of national CVMFS service that everyone can use rather than everyone having to do it themselves is is probably a good thing we should look at doing yeah that, that would be amazing and especially together with rnet right because this is something like rnet could just do this for us and we they could just put the squid proxies everywhere and it would just work because that's the biggest thing where where people told me you will run into problems like how do you want to run this on a, on a on the scale you're running it at and yes i i don't have an answer to this yet and i think that the answer is we we need uh yeah exactly we need help from other people so yeah Okay, thanks. Uh, can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, not a question, just like I uh, mentioned. So I'm already in the second on the list here on the slide. I just want to mention that like this uh, environment, like the NeuroDesk, we ran it successfully on Nectar, in Nectar instance. Uh, so that's like one very easy way, I mean, like to, to run it. So you can contact us, uh, anybody that would like to run it in a Nectar instance, but uh, equally, well, you can run it like on your, Laptop, computer, or desktop. Um, just a crawler here. Yes, yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, when you talk about security scanning, are you talking for external vulnerability scanning or internal uh, sort yes. of things like malware, tro um, trojans, and things like that being yes. lobbed into? Yes, exactly. So very, very good question. So the problem is that our containers run on potentially sensitive data, right? We have potentially human data in there that let's say there is a tool in there that takes this data and steals it and sends it somewhere else. That's something we definitely want to avoid. So we want to see if we can scan for patterns of tools that could do that. And also we would like to scan for tools like crypto things where people just misuse things, exactly malware, but also exactly just outdated li libraries. So we actually know that we are like, the problem is a lot of our software runs, for example, on Ubuntu 16.04, and it doesn't run past that. So we know that Ubuntu 16.04 has a lot of security issues by now. And I just want to be aware of what we're running on the HPCs, because that's a big of a problem that I see that when we build this for everyone and people run it on an HPC and something goes wrong, then people will go screaming at us. So that's somehow why I want to build security in from the start to make sure that these containers can't do anything evil. Don't steal data, don't mine crypto stuff. So that's a bit the plan. But yes, it's, it's, it's tricky because yes, we haven't made a lot of progress on that side. So what, what uh, software are you using to do that? For the uh, vulnerability scanning? Yeah. Uh, currently, we're using the Docker, what they use. So they, there is a Docker Hub uh, plug uh, well, feature that just has a security feature that is called Scan for Vulnerabilities. But um, otherwise, we, we scan the, the flat files that we have in the containers for, for signatures. But that's, that's pretty much how far we got with this. So I think it's, it's not yet well developed. So we definitely need help there. Stefan, 
um, interesting talk and um, hi, hi to a bunch of uh, people that I haven't seen for a while. Um, just wondering, I, I missed what what you said about the base system that you're building on. Have you chosen a, a base OS or anything that you're layering up on as a standard or? Yeah, okay, so there are multiple answers to this. So the, the desktop environment that you see when, when where everything runs in, this is based on Ubuntu, uh, the latest version of Ubuntu. So we try to keep this quite current because this is where probably a lot of attack surface would happen. The problem is that these internal containers that we build, they really depend on the software that we're building. So we're building it whatever that tool runs best in. So we have CentOS, quite old versions of CentOS, quite old versions of Ubuntu, uh, old versions of Debian, basically whatever that tool works well in. Okay. And that's, I think, the problem because in these sub-containers, that's where I think the, the security problems will happen. I, I wonder whether um, there's a, a similar project that I can't, well, similar in some ways, um, in, but, but with a slightly different, uh, scope and you've gone a bit further up the stack. I, I think the um, the European uh, what's it called? Uh, it's E E S S. Yes, I. easy. Yes, yes, easy. Yeah, yeah there's an the European easy environment for scientific software installations. Yes. But, yes. Yeah. Yes, so I, I saw that talk and it's, it's really cool. So what they basically do is they say we don't need containers. We build everything from source and they basically use Gen two. Um, and they build every package newly for Gen 2, and then they have wrappers for different systems that they can run on. And I think it's a really, really cool approach, and I'm following that project. The problem I see is the, the pain they currently go through to actually build their software again. Yeah, yeah, That's, okay. yeah. I, I had not, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that. I assume you're talking about the FOSDEM talk or. Something yes. like that, but yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, that was okay. just a very recent talk where, where they presented that. And I think it's a super cool project and I want to see it take off. But I looked at their builds of some of the tools that we would need. And like, it takes days to get a tool built into their environment because you basically start, right? You, you compile everything. So for every tool they have, they compile everything from source, which is just a massive task. And I'm not sure if it will scale. That's a bit, that's what I'm looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you, yeah. Thanks for that, Stefan. Uh, I think we've got to move on. Very interesting. And uh, thanks for sharing that. Thank you for all um, the feedback. Thank you. Uh, we might move on to Jake now on the uh, Nectar registry. Hi. Um, just try to share my screen now. Bum, bum, bum. Hi, can everyone see this? Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Jake. Uh, I'm with ARDC and um, I'm in the core services. So we run the Nectar Research Cloud and um, it's a cloud much like AWS and uh, GCP is a cloud, but we are of course much smaller. Um, so um, today I'm just gonna talk about our, what we are trying, what we're doing in um, the containerization space for Nectar. So Nectar Research Cloud runs on OpenStack and um, OpenStack itself has uh, many services like Nova, Cinder, and Swift. They are the functional equivalent of EC2, EBS, and S3. Um, all these services are essentially just uh, Python processes. And so OpenStack itself, they have a half yearly release and um, the release um, goes alphabetically ordered like train usury, Victoria, Wallaby. And Nectar, what we do is we take the upstream code um, of every released, we test and we patch them, and then we upgrade the production cloud. Mm. So um, there are a few reasons for the patches. Um, some of the patches are for this, what we term as Nectarism, which are just business requirements 
um, things Nectar needs to do that no other um, cloud in the world wants to do, needs to do. And um, the other reason for patches are the bugs and features that we contribute back upstream. So um, we have a production architecture, which are just basically a bunch of Ubuntu VMs. And we have um, different bunches for each release version. All right. <clears throat> so why do we have that? It's because um, problem. Because uh, first of all, when we patch the upstream code, um, upstream builds binary packages like Red Hat and Ubuntu, they build binary packages. But once we have our patches in, um, we can't just use their binary packages. So we need to build the packages and um, building Debian packages is really a pain. Um, the other problem we have is um, Nectar runs on these Ubuntu VMs. But um, because different open source version requires different libraries uh, due to different versions of libraries. So we have to spin up basically a new bunch of VMs for every time we have a new release. And um, luckily, you know, um, there's a technology out there that solves this um, packaging problem and the library problem, which is containers. So um, the other thing we are doing for containers is uh, in a service called um, Magnum. Um, Magnum is Container Orchestration as a Service. It's a long name. Sometimes I forget what it means too. But um, what it does is it builds Kubernetes cluster. So um, generally people want to try to use Kubernetes, but nobody wants to build Kubernetes cluster or manage them because um, well, I wouldn't want to if I have the choice. So what Magnum allows a user to do is just simply through a dashboard interface, just say spin up a Kubernetes cluster for me and give me kubectl. And from there, um, <clears throat> yeah, you can get your cluster and control it. Um, it uses uh, OpenStack native resources. So for example, um, it builds up the cluster using Nova instances and uses the Cinder volumes and uh, Octavia load balances to, for, for the cluster. So um, each cluster is made out of two instances, VMs. Um, so when they start up the cluster, every um, thing in there is basically a container. So you have like almost 10 container, 10 different types of containers. You have the Kubernetes family of containers like core DNS and Fano and things like that. And you also have the um, OpenStack containers like the OpenStack Cloud Controller Manager and the CSI Cinder. These are containers that um, in, uh, have, it's a layer between the Kubernetes cluster and the OpenStack cluster so that when you use the kubectl command to say, uh, give me a Kubernetes volume, it actually can talk to OpenStack and say, uh, give me a OpenStack volume. And then they're actually the same thing and they work. They can be attached to uh, your ports and things like that. Um, so because it's about two Nova instances of 10 containers, each is about 20 image pools each time someone spins up uh, uh, a cluster. And that's the problem. Um, so all these containers that make up the Magnum cluster, they are from different repositories um, because and like the different, um, how do I say, organizations um, working on different parts of it. So um, we needed a way to mirror these containers or have a static mirror so that uh, say, um, if um, somebody deletes their container from their repo, a user, um, it will not break our service basically of a user trying to spin up a news cluster, which actually happened uh, a, a while back. Um, and then the very famous incident of uh, Docker Hub limiting pools, uh, which, you know, like just will, will cause us to have uh, intermittent failure for users, not a good thing. So one of our solution would be just to, um, you know, create our own registry. So 
we have started a work on creating a new Nectar registry. And that's the next part of it. So uh, Nectar now, we have a registry, uh, just to recap the problems. The first problem is we needed a place to host the images that we're using to build up the Nectar cloud. The second problem was we need to a place to host the images for the user's cluster. So we have um, settled on using this solution called Harbor. Um, we run it on Kubernetes <laughs> and it's spun up. The Kubernetes cluster is spun up by Magnum on the Nectar Cloud. So we are dot footing our own Magnum service and the um, uh, engineers among us who have seen hey, is there a circular dependency, you know? So whether this is um, brave or stupid, time will tell. And for my bosses here, don't worry, we have a backup plan. Um, so yes, the Nectar registry, we use the Nectar Swift object storage. So this is uh, using the S3 plugin. Um, so this is just like S3 object storage. So it's virtually, unlimited storage for us with a star because virtually unlimited is marketing talk it's uh, not technical talk um, so yeah we, we can grow and store a lot of images if we want if we need um, uh, the harbor registry allows us to replicate repos so we can just point it to a repo and say rep, um, pull everything in and replicate uh, just keep a mirror of it which allowed us to easily migrate from Docker Hub when they started implementing the limits. It also has a proxy cache functionality. So um, you can say, yeah, um, if I access this repo of this container um, in, in Harbor, um, check if you have a local copy. If you do not check um, Docker Hub for the copy. And then in the newer version, um, whenever you do a pull, it actually do a hit request uh, to Docker Hub to see if it has changed, the container has changed on Docker Hub. And I think the hit requests do not consume limits. So it sort of intelligently um, try to consume as less, as little um, resources as possible. So some future work for us. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to extend the registry to our Nectar users. So. Um, so it will be cool if like a, a, a Nectar project on the cloud already has some allocation quota and says like, yeah, you can uh, also use this quota to host your container images. And here's the URL for all your repos. <coughs> um, but this uh, needs a bunch of work to integrate into the Nectar cloud, mainly a bit about um, allocation and um, the what's that called, roles, like well, which user belongs to which project and things like that and how much code are they have. Um, Harbor needs to be able to see this information. So because it's a bunch of work, uh, we don't know whether users are interested and we would really be interested, um, we would like to know if users want this and if they're interested, do let us know so we can work on it, justify our work on it. Yep. Um, thank you, that's all for my presentation and questions. Next questions for Jake, but maybe two minutes. Hey, Jake Carmel here. Um, it's really a, a question for you, but a little bit more broadly as well. Um, with the registry working group, um, um, how does this information feed in? And do we have other use case examples of people building registry? Um, so the registry working group has uh, sort of like two things we want to do. One of them would be um, the CVMF based uh, registry that we seen for Steven's um, talk. Um, the other one is a mirror, a static mirror, um, which, uh, which this, this, what Nectar registry can um, provide the functionality, but we have to um, see what we want to mirror and whether we have enough resources for it and things like that. Sorry, yeah. So yeah, um, the registry working group is has a few things that we can work on and this, 
Nectar Registry is one of them, and Stephen's Registry is another of them. <laughs> Sorry. One more question. No. All right. Okay, we might move on. Um, thanks for that, Jake. Much Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. Uh, we might move on now to Anthony. It's QUT Ecoacoustics. Are you ready to go, Anthony? Let's see. Cool. Can, uh, can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Cool. Um, I work for a research group. We deploy um, acoustic sensors out into the bush. And with those sensors, we record audio. And from that audio, we try and understand what's going on in the landscape. So we listen for um, geophony, so noise from plants, wind, rain, anthropophony, noise from humans, machines, that sort of stuff. And most importantly, biophony, so noises from animals. So bird calls, koala grunts, cow moos, frog choruses, you name it. Um, and we collect a lot of data. Uh, so we have multiple instances of our software running for different projects. One, one of our instances is um, older, it has about 139 terabytes of audio which is about 68 years worth of listening. Um, audio is interesting in that it's not like video. The, the size of data is much smaller compared to the temporal amount of data you collect. And we've started another project called the ATO and we're gonna collect about three petabytes of audio over the next five years. There's uh, 400 of the sensors you see there on the left, recording 24 hours a day, deployed all across Australia. Um, we're in Brisbane, we have a few developers of which I am one and about half my time is spent um, doing server administration uh, and DevOps, that sort of stuff. Um, our primary product um, is a web application uh, that now runs in containers. Um, it's pretty old and, and needs a lot of special care to keep going. Uh, we used to run the neck path. And um, we used to have just raw VMs provisioned and we um, automated that through Ansible. Um, what that didn't do for us though, was address um, developer concerns. So if I had a student uh, or junior developer working on our website, I needed to be able to spin up the same stuff that was in production and test it locally. And so, we started using containers for the local development experience, uh, particularly Docker Compose, which is really nice. And eventually those containers migrated their way to production. And so now um, we're running um, all our stuff at QUT uh, in, on private VMs. And the extent of our container orchestration is um, running Docker Run a bunch. Uh, and it will basically just run shell commands in the end. So it's just Docker run on 16 different servers. And um, so far that kind of works for us. Um, there are obviously ways we could make that better though. Um, because of our scale and who we are, we don't want super fancy infrastructure. Um, has to be small, has to be implemented in small steps has to be understandable for people who don't have a lot of background knowledge um, and versionable. Um, I've done a lot of reading on Kubernetes because the advantages look interesting, but I've never actually used it. So from what I can tell, it's probably not the right fit for us. And so the question is, what orchestration should we use? And, and that's something I'm still investigating. Um, we had the opportunity to move to AWS and we decided against it because we have uh, what, what we're calling an asymmetrical scale. We collect a lot of data, but we don't actually have that many compute requirements um, in terms of the website. 
analysis is done on um, the university's PBS system. And um, a lot of these managed Kubernetes instances for existence, for example, only exist in the cloud. So I'm not sure even if there was a managed Kubernetes instance we had access to, how I would use it. But it's just stuff I don't know. Um, yeah, this is pretty much what we use at the moment for our, our devops -y stuff. Um, In, in some sense, we've kind of regressed with where we are with our servers, and that's just because of a, a, a cost thing. Um, and we'd like to make more use of um, AWS in the future. Um, there's some really good things about using Ansible and just Docker Run. Um, things actually get really simple. Ansible is a single source of truth for um, provisioning our servers, deploying our apps, all the config secrets, they're all in one spot. Um, and then moving our apps to be um, compiled in Docker containers on CI servers as code changes is um, really much um, better in terms of maintenance. So um, our containers are built more often and we have less breaks that are unnoticed for longer because of the containers building it on the CI. The other good advantage of moving most of our apps to containers is we don't have an Oz monoculture anymore. And we're able to take advantage of things like um, Alpine for um, services that really don't need any dependencies on the file system. Um, um, one thing I'm really cautious about is um, how much knowledge a team member needs to have to be able to deploy new things or uh, maintain a system, especially if I leave. Um, I don't want a bus factor of one. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how to deal with uh, container orchestration stuff in, in, in what I'd call our hybrid cloud scenario. And yeah, so that's pretty much me and what I do. Excellent. Thanks, Anthony. Um, any questions for Anthony? Uh, I can't see everyone, so you might just need to pipe up if you've got a question. Quick question from me. How do you um, transport the capture sounds to your infrastructure? What transport method do you use? Uh, sneak in that. So we post SD cards. Um, it's actually fairly high bandwidth in the end. Uh, we have considered doing my uploads via um, AAR net nodes. So a lot of our deployments cut uh, through universities and that should be feasible. Um, but many of the sensors are you know, deployed in the middle of the desert. And the easiest thing for people to do is put the SD cards in a, in a post bag and, and they arrive back in our doorstep and we upload them at some point later. Fair enough, there would be no coverage over there with uh, mobile networks. Yeah, and we have um, investigated um, remote streaming data um, and it's something that's becoming more feasible, you know, as new technologies emerge. But you know, when you're recording 24 hours a day, it's just easier to send back an SD card. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. So you, you said, Anthony, that um, you, know, you weren't sure whether, you know, how effective Kubernetes would be to you know, provide assistance you know, to, to you and your group. Um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, we, we're trying to do with Arcos to provide, you know, sources so that you can go to, you know, expertise and um, find out those, those answers easily. You can, you know, say in a, in a hacky hour or something like that, where you can go and ask an expert and, uh, and they can say, well, you can do this, this and this, and, you know, it might be beneficial or, you know, maybe it's not beneficial. So hopefully in not too distant future, we'll be able to, offer that service. That's exactly what I'm looking for. 
Okay, we might, uh, if there's no more questions, we might move on to our last presentation. Um, oh no, sorry, we've got two more. Um, we've got Ryan, are you yep. ready to go, Ryan? Thanks. I'll just share my screen. Is that full screen for everyone? Yep, looks good. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Australian Imaging Service. Um, so a bit of high level. Um, roughly one third of the population of Australia has a medical imaging scan per year. This is uh, just the medical ones, not including ASMRC and MR MRFF funded ones. Um, so there's a lot of value um, to be had in handling in a private um, and respectful way to patients their data for new diagnosis, uh, new treatments, and new basic understanding that imaging uh, gives us. So what we are doing is building a federation to securely handle this imaging data and allow collaboration across both Australia and, and internationally. So what we have is a federated um, set of nodes um, where we can integrate directly with clinical devices and viewers, um, provide in-browser uh, medical annotation, uh, AI segmentation, and a number of analysis capabilities um, in a ring-fenced secure environment. Um, so just to talk about the scale, um, this is our federation currently, um, either in production or in negotiations with different uh, local health districts around the country. So in blue are institutional sites, so say the University of Queensland or the University of Sydney um, would run a node over which they have governance and they cover the cost for their storage and compute. And then a number of pink sites, which are the data sources, um, so private house private public hospitals, clinics, sites, um, which our researchers or affiliates work closely with to do their research um, and for patient treatment. Um, and importantly, you know, one of the things that kind of dictated the approach that we take is we're not just Australia-based, we need to deploy internationally. So we have nodes that we are deploying in the US and Europe, um, as well as a number of clinical sites um, that we'll be integrating with. And we are in conversation to um, build a sister federation across the European Union. So we really needed something that kind of has that international scale. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so number of academic partners, um, quite a bit of funding from the Australian Research uh, Data Commons, their platform scheme, through the Australian Cancer Research Foundation um, and, and a couple of other um, grants have kind of all merged together to, to help contribute to this platform. Um, and of course the team. Um, so I help bring together the idea, the vision, the funding, um, but many of these people were the ones who kind of do all the work to, to really make this um, feasible um, and names are here. Um, so how does this deal with Kubernetes? Um, as I mentioned, we need to be able to deploy on many different infrastructures. So some people run on-prem, some people use commercial cloud, uh, many people use Nectar's OpenStack. So we needed a solution um, to build consistent nodes from a single code base across all of those. So Kubernetes is, is, is that approach. Um, so AIS consists of two major things. Um, each institution has a node. Um, which is built using Helm and, and customized um, for the peculiarities of, of the different um, Kubernetes managed service or, or not managed as it may be. Um, Prometheus for the reporting layer and um, we'll be lo looking at Istio for the service mesh. Um, this sits as a sidecar inside every container um, to kind of give you that, um, I think it's layer seven um, security and controlling the traffic between every single container that we're deploying on the node. Um, we're also looking at potentially using Kubernetes for a bunch of edge devices. Um, so best practice is you de-identify data before it ever leaves the hospital. You don't want patient data hitting a re uh, university system and then having to deal with it afterwards. 
So we are looking at a couple technologies, clinical trials processor, Exmat upload tool, Gadgetron, um, and Clara endpoints, and being able to manage a fleet of edge devices, either one-to-one -one for an instrument or one-to-one -to, -one to a clinical site, depending on whether they're using the standard DICOM protocol or they're using something proprietary. So that's kind of the, the high level approach that we're using for Kubernetes for this. What's actually in a node? Um, so the core technology is XNet, um, which has a built-in pipeline engine. So this means when data hits, um, you can do quality assurance, any containers or analyses that you want and have that standardized and have the data management system do the orchestration so that you're capturing direct acquisition from the instrument and every step for what was done um, for QA, what analysis, sorry, what analysis was done um, and having that full provenance and um, auditing trail. So you can see who's touched the data, has someone signed off to allow this data to be changed. Because in many cases, we want to be able to hold the sole source of, source of truth for this patient data. So we have to make sure that we always keep uh, an un unaltered original copy. Um, and then we're expanding that with a couple other capabilities. So NVIDIA's Clara for machine learning, which we'll be looking at Q4 to Q1 next year. Um, Neurodesk, which was discussed earlier through the ADEPT project, um, we'll be looking at being able to provision that on AI nodes directly. Um, we're looking at production Q4, Q1 next year similarly. Gadgetron for um, MRI reconstruction, particularly around cardiac and, and respiratory. Um, and then there um, are two projects around um, our studio and our shiny and Jupiter to be able to launch those directly from XNAT with the value there being that they're inside the same security net um, and it exposes the patient session and um, subject uh, hierarchy in XNAT directly as Python and, and R objects, which makes it easier um, to kind of integrate your, your workflow in and put the data back um, using a RESTful API. Um, and lastly, we'll be integrating with, with REDCap um, as a, I guess, more trusted source. Um, and we expose um, front end uh, REST APIs and browser interface for users or for integration with other platforms such as the characterization virtual lab. Um, starting to get slightly, slightly down, um, what a node looks like. So we have um, the core XNAT data management and a series of components there, which is what the user, the end user in interacts with. Um, so for all their visualization, um, annotation, initiating the pipelines, et cetera. Um, and then that has a number of plugins which coordinate a number of things. So the, the first thing is Xsync. Um, so what this does is allow you to securely transfer data between two of the federated nodes. Um, and we're looking at building Globus endpoints as the, as the backend for this. Um, the second is the viewer plugin, um, which will have a lot of work as part of the ADEPT project to be able to uh, run um, containerized pipelines or lightweight um, desktops and have that viewed directly from the browser um, through XNet. And that's what the, uh, the, the Jupyter and the RStudio integration are as well. Um, we have a machine learning plugin. Um, this is particularly for Clara Train so that clinicians and researchers can do uh, AI assisted annotation um, and segmentation directly in the browser and have that real time feedback um, for their data set and, and, and training. Um, and kind of the, the core of it all is that container service. Um, so you see some things integrate with both the ML and container service. So the container service is the part that really monitors the, the health of all the individual pods, does the spinning up and down, um, assigns things to different projects, um, exposes the XNet data to different containers. So it is the, the base workhorse that does all the orchestration for a number of tools. And then those tools may talk back and be exposed to the user through uh, an ML or viewer plugin, but otherwise um, they will go do their thing 
um, and they will dump the results back into XNAT, notify the user, text message, email, um, and then they, they have the results. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, looking with integrating a number of edge devices um, and having all of our containers um, as part of the AIS repo um, and looking at upstream sources such as um, what Neurodesk is doing um, for potentially secure um, containers. Two things that um, aren't quite necessarily in scope for the, the ARDC funding, but things we're, we're looking at um, are one, integrating with edge devices, not at the data management layer, but directly at the computational layer. So what this allows you to do is say um, real time or near real time reconstruction directly from the clinical site using research systems with a much higher fidelity than is possible at any hospital in Australia currently. Um, and with Clara looking at federated learning um, between nodes so that you never actually have to move the data, you, you just move your um, models. So that's it. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan? Nothing for Ryan. Okay. I have a quick, quick one yep. on Istio. What was your experience with uh, having to deal with Istio and the benefits you got out of it? Um, so I guess I should, should, should clarify that. Um, we are looking at Istio, but we, we don't have it uh, in a in, uh, production environment at this point. So we have a number of nodes which are running an old architecture. We're looking at going live or having the, the 1.0 um, of this Kubernetes helm and um, customized by the end of quarter three, beginning of quarter four, at which point we'd start looking at moving nodes from the current architecture. Um, to the fully Kubernetes approach. Okay, thanks, Ryan. We might uh, move on then. We're getting a bit short on time now. Um, and the last presentation is from Gordon. Okay, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. I'll just try and share my screen. Let me find it on this. So while Gordon's working that out, I'll, um, so after his presentation, we'll, um, we'll stop for probably about a 10 minute break um, and then we'll come back and, uh, and we'll have some, some more breakout rooms and you'll be able to go through um, some of the things that you're working on in each of your own teams um, in a more sort of informal environment. But over to you, Gordon. Okay, uh, can you see that? Yes, we can. Um, uh, it's not in presentation mode. How's that? It's, I don't think it's in presentation mode still. Uh, um, well, I may just go with it as it is. Yep, we'll be right. Um, it's large enough to see that, right? Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'm from OzSRC in Perth. If we expand all the acronyms there, it's the Australian Square Kilometre Array uh, Resource Centre. Um, as the name suggests, um, working on uh, well, setting up a resource centre to handle data that will come off the Square Kilometre Array Telescope. Um, at this point in time, we are working with the precursor telescopes. So there are smaller um, 
telescopes already running, uh, ASCAP and MWA. Uh, from a development point of view, we're a, we're a team of four, but we are hopefully expanding. Um, we have minimal experience with container orchestration, but we have run containers, Docker and Singularity in particular. Um, and uh, we have a resource at Pawsey running on the Nimbus OpenStack there. So the square kilometre array telescope is expected to produce around 600 petabytes of data per year. Um, and science teams uh, around the world will need to access uh, uh, advanced data products that we will be producing from the semi-raw data that comes off the telescope. Um, we've uh, developed a system called RADIC which stands for Radio Astronomy Data Enhancement Cloud, uh, which provides these advanced data products. Um, but we still, we, we have um, three types of users that we've um, identified. So we have uh, the scientists themselves. Um, we have pipeline developers that will develop pipelines to um, produce the uh, uh, advanced data output from the uh, telescope data. And we've got system administrators to, um, or we will hopefully have system administrators to uh, administer the system once it's up and running. So we're very much in the design phase at the moment. Um, and um, it is very much a, a big data problem. Uh, we, we are bringing data to the computation, uh, sorry, computation to the data um, as the data comes directly into the Pawsey Center. Um, we have been using traditional HPC uh, methodologies. Uh, we have a SLURN cluster running, for instance, uh, which is running with um, a couple of projects that we have up and running on the precursor telescopes. Um, and as traditionally expected, it's a stable, mature technology. Um, persistent data is easily uh, catered for. Um, we have uh, MPI and um, interband interconnects for parallelization of code. Um, however, we have fairly inefficient resource usage because the, uh, the cluster is up all the time, uh, whether it's all being used or not. Um, and we have poor failover and redundancy. So if uh, a head node goes down on the, on the um, Slurm cluster, for instance, uh, we have to get in there and rescue it and um, restart the system. Um, so we've been looking at containerization and um, we realized that um, the, the, the touted um, advantages of high availability, high scalability, um, uh, resilience especially are going to be very useful for our, um, for at least part of our uh, workflow. Um, abstraction over cloud infrastructure as we are running um, on the cloud uh, is, is very useful, but it does come at a cost. And that cost is the complexity of uh, setting up and running uh, your containers um, on specific clouds. Um, there are some disadvantages. MPI is, is kind of an issue. We, we tend to be uh, focusing on using singularity. Um, but we have anecdotal evidence that uh, most of the codes that are coming into our pipelines and use MPI aren't actually using the MPI libraries for real um, inter-process communications. They're normally actually being used for more trivial tasks such as data partitioning, um, which we can achieve at the container level um, and in most instances remove the need for MPI in, in that particular um, environment because most of our problems are embarrassingly parallel. Um, configuration can be very daunting. We are doing this all by ourselves um, and pretty much from scratch uh, and upgrade does seem to be um, quite an issue if you want to upgrade any of the parts of the, of the, uh, of the cluster. Um, so from using um, identifying users from the precursor projects, um, the sorts of 
architecture we're looking at is, is like this. So the um, boxes in yellow we already have. Um, and if you have a look, uh, can you actually see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the idea was uh, to use a container um, uh, technology to provide um, Jupyter Hub and some uh, NextFlow um, pathways for running uh, pipelines. Um, we have considered looking at OpenShift to sit on top of OpenStack. Um, and that's possibly a, a path that we'll look at uh, a little further down the track when we um, get uh, administration access on, on some of these clouds. Um, but this was the vision that we kind of have come up with. I might return to that in a tick. Um, so the proposed architecture, we, we have to, um, we're restricted by the environment we have. We have the Nimbus OpenStack private cloud, uh, essentially on Ubuntu images, um, but there's no Elbas, Octavia or Magnum on uh, this particular uh, installation. And there was originally only a partial heat installation. So without those additional plugins, uh, much of which I found out a little further down the track, halfway through trying to install various um, versions of Kubernetes, uh, it does make it slightly problematic. Um, so the requirements there are uh, what have come out of the uh, uh, use case analysis and some of the things further down here, like the load balances, high availability, user spaces and persistent storage, um, to make it a slightly more difficult task than just setting up a basic Kubernetes cluster. Um, however, originally we weren't wedded to any particular technology. Um, so we had several things to look at. Um, and we did have a look at Docker Swarm, uh, Kubernetes and Mesos Marathon, but we settled on having a, a closer look and identifying um, advantages and disadvantages um, between Mesos and Kubernetes. Um, so I kind of went through uh, the differences between them and for what we actually wanted to do, there didn't seem to be much in the way of an advantage one way or the other. Um, we weren't probably going to be scaling up to uh, 10,000 instances at a time. So that ability that Mesos has didn't really apply to us. Uh, and the quote there on the right is from um, Emeril Does Razik, who is the product manager for Mesosphere, who actually uh, produced Mesos. Uh, but he was asked what he considered were the key differences and um, what environments suited the two different um, technologies. And as he says there, if you're dedicating exclusively to uh, Docker slash Singularity, orchestration and you're willing to get your hands dirty, um, Kubernetes is, is a good technology to consider. Um, I put a reasonable amount of weight on that quote. I possibly should have looked at the second part of his statement, which um, uh, I suppose you would expect because he does come from Mesosphere, but um, they're, they're all salient points there. Uh, Mesos does make it quite easy to um, move these things across plant cloud providers and data centers, uh, although easy is a relative term there. Um, however, um, we did choose Kubernetes, uh, mainly because as we found out, we had no Magnum or Heat set up on OpenStack and we don't have administrative access to that particular infrastructure. Um, we already had the Spark Yarn um, Hadoop environment running. So additional features in Mesos were thought unnecessary and without the admin access, we probably couldn't uh, viably install it uh, on the resource that we had or the, um, um, the level of resource that we had. Um, so this is what I attempted to build. Um, so it's a high availability um, Kubernetes production cluster uh, with the usual um, uh, HA proxy and keep alive for um, failover and resilience. 
um, and persistent volumes uh, coming via uh, Cinder from uh, OpenStack. Um, we got a fair way with trying to set this up, um, but looking through the uh, the blogs of developers who had experienced setting up Kubernetes from scratch, to me kind of bore a striking similarity to reading posts about survivors from bus crashes. Um, was tales of woe and frustration, time to production was a few months to a couple of years. Um, and it did sound rather daunting. However, we thought, well, you know, how hard can it really be? Uh, so we decided to give it a go. And the hard bits fairly quickly um, surfaced. Uh, there are dozens of tool pathways for installing Kubernetes. And depending on what you're installing it on, uh, what versions of um, firmware you're running, uh, what operating systems you expect to be uh, basing the cluster on. Uh, there's a multiple uh, combinations of these things to get um, uh, Kubernetes up and running. Um, I've used all of those and for one reason or another had to um, had to drop them because they wouldn't quite do what, what I wanted or at least I couldn't get them to do exactly what I wanted. Uh, in the end, I went with Cube Spray uh, with a version of Ansible and my own scripts um, to try and produce what we wanted. I think um, I read a quote somewhere that out of the box Kubernetes is almost never enough for anybody. Um, and after trying to add things like load balancing, ingress, HA proxies, persistent storage, um, shared volumes, uh, twin interfaces, network interfaces, um, and especially VRRP on OpenStack, um, which is the uh, virtual routing redundancy protocol you need for keep alive and HA proxy. Uh, and on top of that, you've got metrics and service discovery, uh, secret managements, uh, and a whole swath of other things that you actually need before you can reasonably claim to have a production level um, cluster that's running and available. Um, some of those guides there that uh, I went through um, kind of reinforced that with um, interesting names such as Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, I particularly liked Zero to Jupyter Hub because they didn't say how long it took. Um, but I'm estimating around 10 to the eight seconds. Sorry, Gordon, we might need to push it ahead a little bit. Okay, well, I think this is the last, okay. last or second last slide. Um, most of that original diagram I've kind of got running. I still need to organize user spaces so that I can install Jupyter Hub and add an ingress controller uh, and integrate the auto scaling that you uh, can produce with Kubernetes uh, with OpenStack itself. Um, so what I've learned in a couple of months so far, two to three months I've been into this, uh, is that setting up Kubernetes clusters is hard, especially in a production environment. Um, Helm charts are extremely difficult things to be throwing at your developers and saying, well, this is how you're going to develop and deploy. Um, most of the research you have to do uh, yourself because of the specific different parts that uh, make up a working Kubernetes cluster uh, and the different versions of different parts that are all interrelated. Uh, I found version creep to be quite a killer in this and debugging when it takes over a half hour to uh, configure and run up a cloud uh, for every time that you uh, want to change a configuration aspect makes it uh, a very time consuming process. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for that, Gordon. Uh, we'll take maybe one question from Gordon. And if we get time later on, we can come back. Any questions for Gordon? Uh, I'll go if no one else has got one. 
Um, what was your biggest hurdle with Cube Admin? Do you think, Gordon? Cube Admin. Um, my issues with Cube Admin were that we were running uh, on Ubuntu with OpenStack without Elbas, and I was trying to set up a uh, a load balancer um, that would effectively uh, run a public interface, but be able to secure it correctly. I didn't get any further with it than that um, uh, because I switched back to Cube Spray after after hitting that uh, that block. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Cheers.